Hi guys, welcome to computerized control. Today we are going to introduce in lesson one discrete time systems. And the best way to introduce the discrete time systems is with an example. So let's study this prey predator model. So imagine that you have wolves and hares, and in month k, hk is the number of hares, and wk is the number of wolves. In a situation without predators, hares will grow 10% a month. In a situation without prey, wolves disappear 40% a month. But then, when wolves meet hares, wolves will grow 20% the number of hares, and hares will disappear 20% the number of wolves. So, how can we model this in the, as a discrete time system? So, the number of hairs will increase by 10% each month, and the number of wolves will decrease 40% each month. But then, if we have both on the same ecosystem, we know that hairs will decrease by 20% the number of wolves, and wolves will increase 20% the number of hairs. So we can compact these in these equations, and these represent two systems where we have the system of hairs and the system of wolves, and the number of hairs is the input for the system of wolves, and the number of wolves is an input for the system of hairs. And this is what a discrete time system is. A discrete time system is a system where the input signal is a discrete time signal and the output is a discrete time signal as well. And this is what defines a discrete time system. When you have a discrete time system, you can just iterate to get the evolution of the output. So if you have an equation, a difference equation, that's a name we should remember, if we have a difference equation, it will be a recurrency. So in this recurrency, it says that the next output will be depending on the present output and the present input. And then we recur to compute the next. So if we go to the example of the hares and the wolves, we have these two equations for the hares and the wolves, and these are recurrent equations, so these are different equations, and we can just iterate and get the next value, next value, next value, next value, and we do the simulation of the system. And this is an example to introduce what a discrete time system is. In continuous time systems, we have developed several system properties. Are they valid here as well? Pretty much yes. So we will have linearity. We can have systems that are linear or nonlinear. We will have time variant systems and time invariant systems. And we can have causal systems and non-causal systems. And you know that in continuous time systems, we were focused on linearity, time invariance. And causality is always important because we are dealing with real-time systems. And when we put these two together, we get a linear time invariant system. And this is where we are going to put the focus during this semester. To test an LTI system, we have a very important signal, which is the impulse. The impulse will inject a specific amount of energy, and we can see how it reacts. This is the impulse response, so the response of the system to the impulse at the input. And this is a signature of the LTI system. So a different LTI system will have a different signature, a different impulse response. If you know this impulse response, you know everything you need to know about this system. When you put together linearity, time invariance, together with the impulse response, you can compute the output from the input by the convolution. This convolution looks pretty nasty in this equation. Let's try to get some intuition on this, and because we are in discrete time systems, this should be quite easy. So imagine that you are exciting your system with an impulse, and you have the impulse response. 
So this is the, the, the signature that I was mentioning. Now you want to compute the output of the system for a generic input signal. But this input signal is a sequence of impulses. So you can break down this input as several impulses. And for each of these impulses, you know what is the output. So the output is the impulse response scaled by the amplitude of the impulse. So in this case, u0 in the second u1. So you get the impulse response scaled by u1 and now delayed by one sample. This delay here of one sample will reflect the, on the delay here. And the same here, two samples delay, two samples delay. At the end, you can reconstruct the output of the system by superposition of the impulse responses scaled by u0, u1, u2, and so on. And this means the convolution. This is where continuous time systems and discrete time systems will go somehow apart. Because in the first semester, we had the Laplace transformation to get to the transfer function, and here we will use the Z-transform. So the Z-transform is defined as this. So you have here the formula to get from the signal the Z-transform. And when you put this together with the convolution, you get to the concept of the transfer function. And this is pretty similar with what you had on the first semester. In the first semester, you had the convolution between the impulse response and the input of the signal plus a Laplace transformation. And from this, you could get the definition of the transfer function. And the transfer function, what it says is that the Z transform of the output, it's equal to the transfer function times the Z transform of the input. It's pretty much the same that you, as you had on the first semester. At this point, it's important to differentiate between apples and oranges. What do I mean? I mean that you refer to the Z-transformation of a signal and you refer to the transfer function of a system. So signal is the Z-transform, system is the transfer function. Why am I telling you this? Because if I tell you that I have HZ, is it a Z-transform or a transfer function? It really depends on the context. Let me introduce some Z-transforms of important signals. First, the impulse. For the impulse, you have one, and this is something that you can easily demonstrate directly from the form of the Z-transform. Second, we have the step. For the step, the Z-transform is Z divided by Z minus one. For the exponential, you have Z divided by Z minus A. So you have several Z-transforms already computed in the table that you can consult. Additionally, you have tables for the properties. Let me just highlight the most important here. When you delay the signal by one sample, this is the same as multiplying the Z-transform by Z to minus one. And if you do this n times, so if you delay your signal by n samples, this is the same as multiplying by Z to minus n. Let's at this point, make a pause and introduce an application of what we know so far. So imagine that you had this concert hall and you would like to listen to the music that you had on your mobile phone the same way people will if they were on the concert hall. So how would you do it? So first thing is that you would go to the concert hall and would make an excitation like an impulse, and you inject this impulse and you register the impulse response. So this would go like this. From these samples, you can immediately derive the transfer function of the filter to emulate the concert hall. So you would get, for instance, the first seven samples, and from these seven samples, you would check the value, and from the value, you would replace on the proper places, and this is the transfer function of the filter. So this filter would emulate the concert hall. If you pass your MP3 file through this filter, it would feel like you are you were on this concert hall. Pretty cool, isn't it? 
So this concept of transfer function, we will use it in several places. So the first, of course, is to describe the plant from the computer's perspective. So the plant's discrete equivalent. Second, while we are developing our controller, we will want to get to a transfer function. So the control law will be described by a transfer function. And third, when we describe what is our objective, we will use the concept of transfer function for specifying the result, so to specify what is the objective of the control system. Let me tell you a little bit about the pros and cons of computerized control. So the first advantage is flexibility. It's easier to change a part of the code than to rewire an electric circuit. So this is pretty much evident. The second is an opportunity for complexity. Imagine, for instance, that you want your controller to learn about the plant online and readapt the situation. Control accuracy when you are introducing the specific game for or the position of a ball, it's easier to set a number in the computer program than in using circuits and electronics. And of course, we have the memorizing capability of the system. On the downside, we have some dynamic degradation due to the sampling and some noise due to the quantification. These are problems that arise directly from working with the digital system. Additionally, we might have some reliability problems between electronics and the computer system. And the last is interoperability and obsolescence. sense. First, interoperability is just think that you are buying things from two different manufacturers and you will have problem communicating between them. The second is that um, imagine how many operating systems we have been working with in the last 20 years. And this 20 years is the lifetime of, a, of a, the minimum lifetime of a plant. So at this point, we get to the control cycle and you introduce the feedback. So the feedback starts from the plant by observation and then we take the observations that come from the sensor to process and decide. So the controller will actuate again through the plant and the plant will react and this closes our loop. So this control cycle, this feedback loop will operate continuously. Okay, so the difference here now is that the controller will run from inside the computer. If it's running from inside the computer, we will not have the continuous information about the plant. So it will get samples and will process these samples and will actuate on the system through these samples. So the computer control system will close the loop from the sensor to the actuator and the plant dynamics. And for these, we'll read the signals from the sensor through an analog to digital converter and actuate on the plant from the digital to, act to analog converter. So inside the computer, we will need to codify the controller. So the minute we have the transfer function with the controller, we will have to implement it as a different equation. So at the one point, we will read the signal from the analog to digital, and we'll use the signal that is being read to process the next actuation sample, UK, in the present moment, depending on the past one and then we will write on the digital to analog and then wait for this function to be called again. So the bridge between the continuous time and the discrete time will be this sampling period, TS. So when we have synchronized sampling, we want to read, to process and write in the same instance. So this is supposed to the controller is only supposed to operate in this specific instance. But this is the theory, because in practice, we will need some time for reading to processing and to writing. So in between samples K and K plus one, we have the sampling period that goes along, and then we have the reading, the processing, and the writing, and this will take some time. So it's important to check if these T plus T plus T are much less than this TS. So we can say that we are reading and writing in the same operation. If not, we cannot do that. But this is something that we have been exploring on the lab sessions. 
when we have sampling, we have the possibility of having aliasing, and aliasing is somehow a limit on the maximum frequency that we can operate with. So let's check this example where you have one, two, three, four cycles in 10 seconds, and another signal with one, two, three, four, five, six cycles in 10 seconds. And when you sample them both with the same sampling period of one second, you will get these samples. And these samples, you have the samples for 04 hertz and the samples for 06 hertz signal. But when you compare them both, they are the same. So what went wrong? So now what? Now we have to respect the Nyquist Shannon theorem that the sampling period should be higher than two times the maximum frequency. So either you select first the maximum frequency you want to operate and this will set the sampling period, or you select the sampling period and that will define the maximum frequency you can operate. So this is the Nyquist frequency. The Nyquist frequency is P divided by TS. So this is not a matter for debate. So this is a formula that will set the value of the Nyquist frequency. And this Nyquist frequency represents the maximum frequency we can operate with. So when we go to the sample rate selection, the nyquist shannon theorem states that the maximum frequency should be lower than the Nyquist frequency, which is the same as to say the Nyquist frequency should be larger than the maximum frequency. When we go to perfect reconstruction, if we go, if we want to operate on the limit of the Nyquist frequency, then we need to make a perfect reconstruction. And perfect reconstruction will mean to reconstruct to the future, but also reconstruct to the past. And that is not possible because we are in real-time control. So it's much easier and much cheaper to use zero-order old risk reconstruction, which means that the computer will write the value and will retain the value on the digital to analog converter until the next value is written, and again retain, and again retain, and so on. Because we are not using perfect reconstruction, we cannot stay at the limit of the Nyquist frequency. So Nyquist Shannon's theorem states that the maximum frequency is the Nyquist frequency. So it means that if it, this is our maximum frequency we're going to operate, and this comes directly from the specification of the computer control system, we will set the Nyquist frequency based on this. But because we are not making perfect reconstruction, we need to go way beyond that. And in control practice, so not theory, we are going to the practice, we need that our sampling rate or the Nyquist frequency goes 5 to 10 times the maximum frequency. And this 5 to 10 times depend that if we are developing our controller on the continuous time and then discretizing the controller or discretizing the plan and then developing the controller in discrete time. So the two paths I'm referring to is that we have the possibility of designing the continuous in the continuous time domain. So this was the method of the first semester, and this gives us an analog controller. And from that, we can make a discretization. In that case, we should use the sampling rate as 20 times the maximum frequency. The other path possible is that we first discretize the plant, and in that case, we can go to a less conservative case of 10 times the maximum frequency for the sampling rate, and then design the control in discrete time domain. So we'll be speaking a little bit more about this in the future. So one important message, message at this point is that there is no discrete plant. What we have is a continuous time plant and we'll make a description of the plant perceived from inside the computer. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this was useful for your studies. I'm waiting for your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye-bye.